It is true that ancient civilizations always venerated the sun. The chief god in most pantheons is the sun god. However, Zeitgeist implies here that Jesus, the only begotten son of God, is an outgrowth of God's son, S-U-N. God's son, S-O-N, and son, S-U-N, are homophones. But this argument cannot be made in other languages, so the point is invalid. They bring up Horus. This is a far too simplistic representation of the myths surrounding Horus. In reality, there are many versions. There were originally several different gods known by the name Horus. It seems Zeitgeist is trying to make a parallel between Set or Seth and Satan. Besides both of these figures being evil and starting with the letter S in English, there is no parallel. The birth on December 25th can be immediately dismissed as irrelevant because nowhere in the Bible do we find any reference to the birth of Jesus being on December 25th. Nor do we find the birth of Horus on December 25th, but in the month of Koyak or July 15th. Obviously Jesus was not born in December or any time in the winter for that matter because we read in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 verses 7 and 8 that there were shepherds watching over their flocks at night. Jesus was most likely born in late spring or early autumn, as most scholars would agree. This date of December 25th was chosen about 300 years after the origins of Christianity in AD 354 by Roman Bishop Liberius of the Roman Catholic Church, based upon pagan thought and coinciding with the pagan sun god worship observance of the winter solstice and the Roman traditions of Saturnalia, rather than on biblical truth. This is why many Christians do not celebrate Christmas because it is irrelevant to the Bible and rooted in pagan practice. Regarding Isis being known as Isis Mary, there is no scholarly information to substantiate this claim. There is also no evidence that Isis was a virgin in the myth. Translated from the Hymn of Osiris, the myth distinctly says Isis drew from him his essence. Various Egyptian scholars state very clearly that Isis was not a virgin when she gave birth to Horus, as Mary was when she gave birth to Jesus. For example, Richard Wilkinson, author of Complete Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egypt states, Through her magic, Isis became pregnant by him, eventually giving birth to their child, Horus. As for the Star in the East claim, there is no such myth in the story of Horus. There is no evidence in Egyptian astrotheology that they assigned the alignment of Sirius, the star in the east, to signify the birth of Horus. Neither is there any mention of any kings of any number. Even if Zeitgeist was right about this claim, it is irrelevant, because the Bible does not number the men that came to Jesus' birth, nor were they kings, they were magi, or wise men. Horus becoming a teacher at age 12 is nowhere to be found in the accounts of Horus. There is a form known as Horus the Child, but he wasn't a prodigal teacher. He was kept hidden away in the papyrus marshes by his mother until he was ready to be ruler of Egypt. In addition, no bibliographic material suggests Horus had a ministry, much less at the age of 30, nor was he baptized by Anup. The character Anup, which is also known as Anubis or Anpu, means royal child and is usually depicted as a jackal-headed or wild dog-headed man. Anubis was the lord of embalming, and through this is connected with incense and perfumery, but not baptism. Neither are there any statements to the effect that Horus had twelve disciples. Mention of Horus's followers are in the translation of the Liturgy of Funeral Offerings, the fourth ceremony. Actually, Horus had four followers, called Hiru Shemsu, there is another reference to a group of 16 followers of Horus known as Mesnui or blacksmiths. While 16 minus 4 is 12, this cannot be the intention of Zeitgeist. The total number of followers here is 20, not 12. In regard to performing miracles, there was some magic associated with Horus. But this is with Horus the child, not with Horus the elder or his adult forms. Horus on the crocodiles was a common manifestation of the importance of Horus in healing ritual. The power of this healing seems to come from his mother Isis, who is indeed the goddess of immense magical power. It is not unusual though to find reference to miracles in reading any ancient or modern day literature. 
Nevertheless, we do not find one miracle that Jesus did in the Horus story. Horus did not walk on water, as the narrator claimed, but was thrown into the water. There is also no evidence for these names of Horus in the mythical accounts. He was known as other titles, however. Horus the child was known by magical titles such as Horus on the crocodiles. Horus as son of Isis and Osiris was known as pillar of his mother, savior of his father. And Horus as a sun god was also known as lord of the sky, god of the east, Horus of the horizon, and later associated with Ra. In the fourth dynasty, the king, the living god, may have been one of the greatest gods as well. But by the fifth dynasty, the supremacy of the cult of Ra, the sun god, was accepted even by the kings. The Horus king was now also son of Ra, not the son of God. None of the titles for Horus listed in Zeitgeist are recognized by any Egyptologist. Horus was not crucified, buried for three days, or resurrected for that matter. In some versions, Horus had one or both of his eyes injured, but he was not killed, and it was his father Osiris who was killed, dismembered, reconstituted, and revived by Isis, his magical mother. Furthermore, death by crucifixion was not invented until long after the origins of the myths of Horus. From the earliest times, the god was depicted as a bird or falcon whose eyes are the sun and the moon and whose breath is the cooling north wind manifested in different birds and species. Does this look like Jesus? Again, there is no primary Egyptian records prior to the New Testament to support the resemblances of Jesus and Horus. Next is Attis. Concerning the virgin birth claim, the Olympian gods, or Zeus, cut off the male organ and cast it away. There grew up from it an almond tree, and when its fruit was ripe, Nana picked an almond and laid it in her bosom. The almond disappeared and she became pregnant. Nana abandoned the baby Attis. This is hardly a parallel to the biblical claim, but a desperate exaggeration. Again, December 25th is irrelevant. After Attis was tended by a he-goat, Attis fell in love and was not crucified, but castrated himself under a pine tree, which in no sense can be seen as death by crucifixion on a tree or a cross. Then Sibeli restored Attis to life. Many critics refer to this as the resurrection of Attis, though there is no mention of a tomb or a three-day period. Additionally, apologetics author Charlie Campbell states, The alleged resurrection of Attis isn't even mentioned until after 150 AD, long after the time of Jesus. Furthermore, Dr. Walter Burkert, a Greek religion scholar and author, stated, There is no evidence for a resurrected Attis. Even Osiris remains with the dead. As the Princeton theologian J. Gresham Machen points out, the myth contains no account of a resurrection. All that Sibeli, the great mother goddess, is able to obtain is that the body of Attis should be preserved, that his hair should continue to grow, and that his little finger should move. Dr. Ronald Nash adds, It was only during the later Roman celebration, after AD 300, of the Spring Festival that anything remotely connected with a resurrection appears. Concerning Krishna, in Joseph Campbell's book Occidental Mythology, page 342, he stated, Krishna, whose terrible uncle, Kansa, was the tyrant king. The savior's mother, Devaki, was of royal lineage, the tyrant's niece. And at the time when she was married, the wicked monarch heard a voice mysteriously, which let him know that her eighth child would be his slayer. He therefore confined both her and her husband in a closely guarded prison where he murdered their first six infants as they came. According to this story, the mother Devaki had seven children before Krishna was born. This would not make Devaki a virgin. Distinguished professor of Hinduism in India, Vasudha Narayana, PhD, University of Bombay said, I've never heard of Krishna being born of a virgin, either through Sanskrit or vernacular texts, or even folklore. And born on December 25th, wow. The text says explicitly he was born on the eighth day of the waning moon in the month that now comes between approximately August 15th and September 14th. I can't imagine why people would sit back and cook up all these conspiracies. The only mention of stars in Krishna's birth within Hindu literature is in the Bhagavata Purana chapter 10, 3, 1 through 5. Then there was the supreme hour, all auspicious and most suitable with the constellation of Rahini rising, and all the stars and planets in a favorable position, 
Everywhere was peace. The multitude of stars twinkled in the sky and cities, towns, pasturing grounds, and mines were at their best. The minds of the saintly oppressed, as they had been by the Asura, Kamsa, and his men, turned perfectly contended when in that situation the kettle drums together resounded with the unborn one to be born. Twinkling stars in the sky are far from the biblical account of a star in the east signaling Jesus' birth. In the film Zeitgeist, author Edward Carpenter is cited for providing this information on Krishna's supposed miracles and resurrection. Carpenter in his book, Pagan and Christian Creeds, stated, to go into the parallelism of the careers of Krishna, the Indian sun god, and Jesus would take too long because indeed the correspondence is so extraordinarily elaborate. He then cites Robertson's Christianity and Mythology as a reference. Then Robertson transcribes the outline of the well-known Krishna saga as follows. The son of Devaki, the two brothers grew up in the midst of the shepherds slaying monsters. Arrived at adolescence, the two brothers put to death Kamsa, and Krishna became king. He continued to clear the land of monsters. After having been present at the death of his brother, he himself perished, wounded in the heel by the arrow of a hunter. Thus we read in the well-known Krishna saga that there is no virgin birth, no star, and no miracles. The comparisons are not so extraordinarily elaborate after all. Robertson also stated, the case in favor of the assumption of Christian priority has been in a general way strengthened by the precise investigation of Hindu literature, which has gone to show that much of it, as it stands, is of far later redaction than had once been supposed. Thus, Zeitgeist cites Carpenter, and Carpenter cites Robertson, who admits that Hindu literature is of much later publication than previously assumed, and therefore, any similarities between Christianity and Hinduism were borrowed by the Hindus, and not vice versa. In the long Indian epic poem, the Mahavarata, Book 16, there is an account of the death of Krishna. It reads, Having restrained all his senses, speech, and mind, Krishna laid himself down in high yoga. A fierce hunter of the name of Jara then came there, desirous of a deer. The hunter, mistaking Krishna for a deer, pierced him at the heel with a shaft and quickly came to the spot for capturing his prey. Coming up, Jara beheld a man dressed in yellow robes, wrapped in yoga, and endued with many arms. Regarding himself an offender and filled with fear, he touched the feet of Krishna. The high-souled one comforted him and then ascended upwards, filling the entire welkin with splendor. Krishna died and ascended, but there is still no resurrection, as claims Zeitgeist. It's hard to imagine how this blue Indian man could be mistaken for Jesus, or a deer for that matter. The only similarity we have here is an ascension, which is not even mentioned in Zeitgeist. Even if you do want to take Zeitgeist's premise that the Ascension account might have been borrowed, then who borrowed from who? The earliest testimony for the complete text of the Mahabharata dates to the 1st century AD by the Greek sophist Dion Chrysostom. The available accounts of Dionysus' birth indicate that Dionysus was not born of a virgin. In the best known myth, Dionysus was born through an affair between Zeus and a princess. In another version, Zeus mated with his daughter Persephone and she bore Dionysus. Dr. Edwin Yamauchi, professor of history at Miami University, confirms, There is no evidence of a virgin birth for Dionysus. As the story goes, Zeus, disguised as a human, fell in love with the princess Samel, the daughter of Cadmus, and she became pregnant. Also, not only is December 25th irrelevant to Jesus' birth, there is also no reference to Dionysus being born on December 25th in any scholarly literature. Even some of Zeitgeist's sources, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, note that Dionysus' birth was celebrated on January 6th by some in Alexandria which makes it of no relevance for copycat claims. Indeed, Dionysus was a traveling teacher. At any rate, this is a vague similarity that could be found in most ancient and modern literature concerning any figure with a message to share with others. But there are differences as well. Dionysus wandered the world accompanied with wild women, flush with wine, shoulders draped with fawn skin, whereas Jesus traveled the limited area surrounding Jerusalem providing moral teachings. Though there are accounts of Dionysus filling empty vessels with wine, there is no reference to Dionysus turning water into wine, as Zeitgeist claimed. 
and it is not surprising that Dionysus performed miracles involving wine since he was the god of wine. One historical study explains, the ancient literature says that there was a spring with clear, sparkling, wine-colored water, very pleasant tasting water in which the newly born Dionysus was bathed. Also, a spring in the temple flowed with wine. At Elis, the priests of Dionysus placed three large empty cauldrons in a sealed room to find them filled with wine when they returned the next day. However, from these references it is obvious that there are significant differences between the Dionysus legend and the story in John 2. The spring flowed with water, and the one at Andros flowed with wine, not wine that had once been water. And the empty cauldrons in the Elis temple were filled with wine rather than water subsequently changed into wine key elements in John's story. These differences have convinced most scholars that John or his tradition is not dependent on the Dionysus legend for this story. Research professor Dr. Donald A. Carson wrote, Older attempts to interpret this sign as a Christianized version of the Dionysus myth or of related stories have largely been abandoned in the light of evidence that the alleged parallels are wholly inadequate. Zeitgeist's source for these titles of Dionysus, Acharya S, only says he was considered the only begotten son, Alpha and Omega, etc. Not that he actually was known by these titles. She has absolutely no source for the title King of Kings, which is a generic term in the first place, and secondly does not even suit Dionysus, since Zeus was the head god according to mythology. Nor does the title Only Begotten Son suit Dionysus, since Zeus had several offspring including Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Hermes, Persephone, Dionysus, Perseus, Heracles, Helen, Minos, and Musis. James Frazier, author of The Golden Bough, is cited in Zeitgeist for this claim of the resurrection. With such an array of options, it may be no surprise that at least one variation bears a superficial resemblance to what happened to Jesus. Still, this vague description does not match with the Jewish concept of resurrection. You're going to have to give me a, a, a date for the earliest inscription because Dionysus, I don't know anybody who thinks Dionysus is pre-Christian, not the resurrection portion. Okay, well, uh, all I can tell you is that the myth is that he uh, is torn apart by the Titans, uh, eaten, and he is uh, raised from the dead. Uh, but what is, is the a, date? I don't what know. The, the date I don't know the date of the, as I said, of the original. Um, uh, as far as any writings we have, but I know that the, with, with the myths, that the Greek myths, most of our Greek myths, uh, we do have from later collections. Except we know they are from, they were told earlier because we have the vase paintings depicting them going way back in time. But the point, the question is is there a resurrection and since we don't have any resurrection predating the second century all the way to the fourth century are the earliest ones second to fourth we can say well maybe there's a resurrection there but there's no data even tim callahan the skeptic you just saw defending dionysus admits there is no crucifixion even the skeptic tim callahan critiques the movie zeitgeist saying Perhaps the worst aspect of part one of Peter Joseph's internet film Zeitgeist is that some of what it asserts is true. Unfortunately, this material is liberally and sloppily mixed with material that is only partially true and much that is plainly and simply bogus. The evidence for Jesus as a real historical personage, though meager, is solid. Mithra is the only one of these pagan gods mentioned that could have conceivably come in contact with Christianity. As the late Dr. Ronald Nash puts it, Mithra was supposedly born when he emerged from a rock. Unless this rock was a virgin, there is no virgin birth for Mithra. For the last time, December 25th is irrelevant to origins. The claim of Mithra having 12 disciples comes from Zeitgeist sources, Acharya S., Timothy Freak, and Peter Gandhi, yet there is no documentation for this claim in their books. Acharya S., Timothy Freak, and Peter Gandhi now acknowledge that they got this idea of 12 disciples from a scene where Mithra is framed by two vertical rows of six pictures of what seems to be human figures and Mithra in the middle. The reliefs come from the second century AD, even if these reliefs were dated prior to Christianity, 
The Iranian Mithras had a single companion, and the Roman Mithra had two helpers, which were tiny torch-bearing likenesses of Mithra himself. Mithra also had a number of animal companions, a snake, a dog, a lion, a scorpion, but not twelve of them. Mithra did perform a number of actions rather typical for any deity worldwide, true or false, and in both his Iranian and Roman incarnations. It must be remembered, however, that some general similarities would normally apply to any religious leader. However, these are not objects that require some theory of dependence. Besides, the mysteries were not practiced until the first century AD and Mithraism reached the height of its popularity around the 3rd and 4th centuries, when it was particularly popular among the soldiers of the Roman Empire, but that rules out the possibility of influence on Christianity. In his book Image and Value in the Greco-Roman World, Richard Gordon writes that there is no death of Mithras, and thus there is no resurrection of Mithra, nor is there a three-day burial. Zeitgeist sources Freakin' Gandhi claim that the Mithraic initiates enacted a similar resurrection scene, but their only reference is post-Christian Tertullian's Prescription Against Heretics chapter 40, which is also quoted in the Zeitgeist addendum. In context, this in no way proves Zeitgeist's point, because Tertullian was explaining how Mithraic practices, which were introduced into Roman culture after Christianity, copied Christianity. Mithraic practices were not even in existence in the first century when Christianity began, but they were beginning to emerge in Tertullian's time and apparently copying Christian and Jewish beliefs. The complete passage reads, The devil, of course, to whom pertain these wiles which pervert the truth, and who by the mystic rites of his idols vies even with the essential portions of the sacraments of God, he too baptizes some, that is, his own believers and faithful followers, he promises the putting away of sins by a layer of his own. And, if my memory still serves me, Mithra there, in the kingdom of Satan, sets his mark on the foreheads of his soldiers, celebrates also the oblation of bread, and introduces an image of a resurrection. Therefore, in the very source cited by Zeitgeist and freaking Gandhi, Mithra celebrates and introduces an image of a resurrection, which can hardly be seen as a resurrection of Mithra, or for Mithraic initiates. Additionally, Tertullian's writing is significantly after the New Testament times. Dr. Ronald Nash affirms, No claim can be made that Mithras was a dying and rising god. The tide of scholarly opinion has turned dramatically against attempts to make early Christianity dependent on the so-called dying and rising gods of Hellenistic paganism. Any unbiased examination of the evidence shows that such claims must be rejected. Sunday worship only appears in Roman Mithraism, and Acharya S. is apparently assuming that what held true for Roman Mithraism also held true for the Iranian Mithraism, but there is no evidence for this idea. It is therefore unlikely that borrowing occurred, but if there was borrowing, it was the other way around. Though the Bible teaches that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, and early Christians considered this the Lord's day, they not only worshipped him on this day of the week, but every other day as well, as we read in Acts chapter 2, 46 and 47. And the Jews, such as Jesus, worshipped on the Sabbath, or Saturday. In the early 4th century, it was Constantine of the Roman Catholic Church who paganized the meaning of Sunday. His Sunday Law of March 7, AD 321 read, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. Mithraism could not have influenced the Gospel writers because it was not even known to the Roman world at the time of early Christianity. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, There is little notice of the Persian god Mithra in the Roman world until the beginning of the second century, but from the year AD 136 onward, there are hundreds of dedicatory inscriptions to Mithra. Roman Mithraism was practically a new creation, wrought by a religious genius who may have lived as late as AD 100. We must assume that the pagan gods which Zeitgeist gives examples for are the ones for which they have the best documentation and evidence. As the viewer has seen, the examples given by Zeitgeist are not impressive. Taken together with all the debunked information, the parallels Zeitgeist presented in no way explains causation for Christianity. Before AD 100, all of the mystery religions were still mostly confined to localities. 
but after AD 100, they gradually began to attain popularity throughout the Roman Empire. Many writers used the late source material produced in this period after AD 150 to form reconstructions of what they think the cults must have been earlier to their spread in the Roman Empire. All of these sources and authors cited for these claims in the film Zeitgeist are not original primary sources, nor do they cite such primary or original material in their bibliographies. Even the majority of atheists and non-Christian scholars have rejected the idea that Christianity has been borrowed from ancient myths, including the well-respected Sir Edward Evans Pritchard who wrote, The evidence for this theory is negligible. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which on December 24th aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the three kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise, the birth of the sun. Once again, even if you were to label the three stars in Orion's belt the three kings, it would be irrelevant to the Bible, as is December 25th irrelevant. Though the Magi, not kings, presented three gifts, nowhere do the Bible writers make an issue of there being three of them in number. Apparently, it was insignificant to the Gospel writers, and so it is to us as well. This entire astrological premise is problematic. Not only does Sirius align with the three stars in Orion's belt 365 days a year, and not only in December, but they are more or less aligned to the sun for almost all of the winter months. There is nothing at all special about December 25th. In fact, it is by December 25th that Orion is almost totally below the horizon. It would be much more accurate of Zeitgeist if this event was said to happen a month or so earlier. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo is also referred to as the House of Bread and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to house of bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on earth. Bethlehem indeed means house of bread. Nevertheless, there is no basis for concluding that Bethlehem was a fictitious place which was fabricated based upon the constellation Virgo in the sky. The existence of Bethlehem is attested by biblical and extra-biblical sources. First, Old Testament authors prior to the first century mentioned Bethlehem. Also, the Jewish historian Josephus mentions Bethlehem as the location where King David was anointed to be future king of Israel. J.B. Hennessy reports of the archaeological evidence demonstrating that Bethlehem was inhabited during the Iron Age in the first century. He recorded, Perhaps most important has been the isolation in 1969 of the Iron Age tell. The limits of the Iron Age occupation while not entirely clear, appear to be on the flat surface of the slopes immediately beneath the basilica and to the east. The work was carried out by Israel Archaeological Society. Bethlehem appears to have been a major area of occupation from the Paleolithic period. Former astrologer and author of Spellbound, The Paranormal Seduction of Today's Kids, Marsha Montenegro wrote, You can't just make a story out of names like Virgo, Leo, Taurus, etc. And why doesn't the story begin with Aries? If it did, then Leo comes before Virgo. Yet Leo is supposedly Jesus, the Lion of Judah. It seems it would come after Virgo, not before, in a story. There's another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. 
and by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. Anybody with a simple astrology program can confirm for themselves that during the lifetime of Jesus, or in any other time for that matter, that when the sun rises it is nowhere near the Southern Cross. The idea that the sun rises in the Southern Cross constellation is ridiculous. Dr. Noel Swerdlow is professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. He also specialized in the study of the practice of astronomy in antiquity through the 17th century. He states, that crux, the Southern Cross, was not recognized as a separate constellation in antiquity because, as seen from the Mediterranean, it is low on the southern horizon and is surrounded on three sides by the stars of Centaurus, which is a large prominent constellation, and the four bright stars of crux are included as stars of Centaurus in Ptolemy's star catalog. It is only when you go farther to the south, so that the crux is higher in the southern sky, that it becomes prominent as a group of stars by itself. So its recognition had to wait until the southern voyages of the 16th century. Thus, the Southern Cross was not even discovered or recognized until the 16th century, long after the first century writers of the New Testament. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. Christians have never said anything like this, that the Son, S-U-N, died on the cross. Maybe Peter Joseph wants us to think ancient religions said this, but they did not either, and there is likewise no reference or source for such a saying. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the Son, travels about with. The source for this claim is author and skeptic Acharya S, who alleges the sun's followers or disciples are the twelve signs of the zodiac through which the sun must pass. But Jesus did not pass through his twelve disciples in any fashion similar to the zodiac. If the Bible was based off the zodiac, we would expect to see the similar movement of Jesus through the disciples. Furthermore, the twelve disciples were most certainly assigned by Jesus because of the twelve tribes of Israel which Zeitgeist also alleges is symbolic of the Zodiac. But the book of Genesis was written approximately in 1000 BC and contains the story of the 12 tribes of Israel, which would have occurred even earlier. The division into the 12 zodiacal signs did not occur until the Babylonians made the divisions in the 5th century BC. Therefore, reading astrology into the 12 tribes upon which the apostles of Jesus were based is impossible because the twelve tribes existed long before the division of the twelve signs of the zodiac. Astronomer J. Pasikoff confirms, the Babylonians divided the zodiac into twelve constellations in the fifth century BC. So the only evidence that remains for this claim is the number twelve. If we want to accept their allegations on this, however, we also need to accept that Dunkin' Donuts is owned by an astrologer, since you get a discount when you buy a dozen donuts. Grocery stores are also owned by astrologers, since they sell you eggs by the dozen. Even our legal system must be influenced by astrology, since there are 12 jurors. Unlike fictitious myths and legends associated with astrology, we have much historical evidence that the 12 apostles were indeed real historical people. For example, in 95 AD, Clement wrote, Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. First of all, Zeitgeist stacks this list of 12s by repetitions to make it look more impressive than it actually is. The 12 tribes of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob, and 12 great patriarchs are all the same 12. There is no difference. There are 12 judges of Israel if one was to count, but the Bible never makes any issue or significance out of it. 
There are actually 17 Old Testament prophets, not 12. Zeitgeist missed this figure by five. One can only wonder where they got the idea of there being 12 kings of Israel. If referring to the northern kingdom of Israel, there were 19 kings. And there were also 19 kings in the southern kingdom plus one queen. This is not including the three kings of Israel before the kingdom was divided. If you add these numbers together, you do not get 12. If you subtract, multiply, or divide these numbers, you cannot get 12. And no mention or reference is made in the Bible to 12 princes. If the king's sons are in view here, then Zeitgeist is way off. For many of the 41 kings had numerous sons, like King Ahab, for example, had 70 sons. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. What Zeitgeist refers to as the cross of the zodiac is actually the wheel of the zodiac, which has no relationship to a Roman crucifixion, the way in which Jesus was killed. To extrapolate two perpendicular lines from the zodiac wheel and conclude that Romans used this as their motivation to crucify criminals is preposterous. It was not until Christianity became paganized that the cross image came to be thought of as a Christian symbol. Crosses in churches were introduced in AD 431, and the uses of crosses in steeples came about in AD 586. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. The first age, they say, is Taurus the bull. In Exodus chapter 32, we read that Aaron and the Israelites made an idol of a golden calf and worshipped it, after which Moses shattered the two tablets of the Ten Commandments after seeing the Israelites' idolatry. The Christ conspirators will suggest that the golden calf is the age of Taurus the bull. Where is the documentation for this supposed reality, besides page 146 of Acharya S.'s book? The New Testament, written long after the age of Taurus the Bull in Jesus' generation, also mentions calves, but this is not convenient for their argument. Second, they say Moses represents the preceding age of Ares the Ram. They say that Moses represents the Ram and that this is the reason Jews blow the ram's horn. However, Moses has never recorded blowing a ram's horn. Additionally, Moses cannot be identified as a ram by any interpretation within scripture and does not fit this picture. Even Zeitgeist's own source for this claim, Leopold Wagner, says no such thing. On the page cited of Wagner's book, we read, The use of the ram's horn at this season is appropriate since, according to tradition, it was on this first day of Tishri that a ram was offered up instead of Isaac on Mount Moriah. Thus, even Zeitgeist's source states the obvious reality as to why Jews blow the ram's horn today and says nothing of the age of Ares. The most memorable text in the Bible mentioning a ram is that previously mentioned in Zeitgeist's own source, where God provided the sacrifice of a ram for Abraham instead of Isaac his son. However, this event was generations prior to Moses and would not fit chronologically into Zeitgeist's twisted interpretation of the Bible. The third symbolic age allegedly is the age of Pisces, the two fish. They claim that because Jesus fed 5,000 people with bread and two fish, and because Jesus befriended two fishermen who followed him, that this must be symbolic of the age of Pisces. Actually, four of Jesus' disciples were fishermen, not just two. Though four disciples were fishermen, what about other followers of Jesus? Matthew, for instance, was a tax collector, Simon was a zealot, Luke was a physician and historian, Paul was a Pharisee and a tent maker. What is their significance to astrology? They have none. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Actually, the fish symbol was an identifying symbol for Christ which early persecuted Christians used, and it has nothing to do with the age of Pisces. The Greek word ichthus for fish is an acrostic based on the initials of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Indeed, Jesus fed 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. 
but he later fed 4,000 people with a few fish, or more fish than two fish, and seven loaves of bread. Obviously, Zeitgeist does not quote this event because it does not fit their paradigm. According to Zeitgeist hermeneutic, it could just as easily be called the age of bread, but there is no such thing. Jesus also healed people, gave sight to the blind, raised the dead, walked on water, and cast out demons of people, but there is no astrological ages accompanying these miracles. Besides, fish and fishermen are also mentioned in the Old Testament, which predated Jesus and was prior to the age of Pisces. New Testament stories also refer to a rooster, doves, donkeys, birds, camels, sheep and goats, yet none of these animals would normally fall under the age of Pisces, like fish. In Luke chapter 22 verse 10, Jesus tells his disciples to enter into the city where they will meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Acharya S. and Zeitgeist claim this is a symbolic foreshadowing of the age of Aquarius, or the water bearer. How the text conveys foreshadowing one cannot say, except for Acharya S. Acharya goes farther than Zeitgeist claiming Jesus was baptized in Aquarius, the water bearer, hinting that Jesus will bring in the age of Aquarius. But the age of Aquarius begins around AD 2150, so how exactly was Jesus baptized in Aquarius? Acharya S. then claims that Jesus became the Good Shepherd and the Lamb in Aries the Ram, Aries, from about 2150 BC to AD 1, which has already been attributed to Moses, is now attributed to Jesus, but has nothing to do with Jesus, just as it had nothing to do with Moses. A lamb is not a ram, and has nothing to do with shepherding sheep. The only parallel here is that they are animals. This is a wild generalization. She goes on to state that Jesus told parables of the sowing and tilling in the fields in Taurus the bull. Acharya has now attributed all four of these ages to Jesus somehow, but which one is it? To these critics, any mention of bulls is automatically accredited to the age of Taurus, any mention of animals to the age of Aries, any reference to fish to the age of Pisces, and any reference of water to the age of Aquarius. You would think that there would be much less broad and cryptic references if this were the reality and the intention of the writers of the Bible. Jesus told parables in several agricultural metaphors, including fig trees, wheat and tares, sheep and goats, seeds, and many others. But there is no supposed symbolic age for these parables. Obviously, Bible stories will abound with fish, because fish were the most common source of protein near the Sea of Galilee. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Peter Joseph alleges that the main source for the Christian idea of the end of the world comes from Matthew 28.20. But this passage has nothing to do with Christian views of the end of the world. Rather, a complete thematic treatment of the passages concerning the end of the world make up most Christian views which, for the most part, agree that Jesus will return as a thief in the night in flaming fire taking vengeance on those that don't know God, and the earth will be burned up. Indeed, the word world in the King James Bible is translated to aeon in the Greek or age. This word means forever an unbroken age, perpetuity of time or eternity. Jesus was not referring to any astrological age like Aquarius or Pisces. He was referring to the end of the world or the end of the times as we know it. The Greek word aeon was used again by Jesus in reference to the end of the world when he said, the harvest is the end of the world or aeon and the reapers are the angels. In Luke chapter one verse 70, Jesus refers to God's holy prophets which have been since the world or aeon began. 
God's prophets, such as Moses, did not live in the astrological age of Pisces as Jesus, yet Jesus includes them in this passage. It is obvious Jesus is not referring to an astrological age here. Paul stated in Romans 12 too, Do not be conformed to this world or aeon, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, he is referring to time since the world began until it ends. The Bible also says, The world or aeon passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. The amount of time it takes for the procession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this. The narrator, Peter Joseph, makes sure to say that ancient societies were very aware of this because Zeitgeist's whole premise and theory is dependent upon the ancients acknowledging the astronomical concept to which they refer. However, modern astrological beliefs are not identical to the ancient astrological beliefs and Zeitgeist's argument regarding the various astrological ages is irrelevant. Historian of science and winner of the Genius Award from the MacArthur Foundation, Dr. Noel Swerdlow's response to Acharya's claims in Zeitgeist are as follows. In antiquity, constellations were just groups of stars, and there were no borders separating the regions of one from the region of another. The modern ideas about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius are based upon the location of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations. But the regions, the borders between those constellations are a completely modern convention of the International Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping, and never had any astrological significance. I hope this is helpful, although in truth, what this woman is claiming is so wacky that it is hardly worth answering. So when this woman says that the Christian fish was a symbol of the coming age of Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought of in antiquity. Because in which constellation of the fixed stars the vernal equinox was located was of no significance and is entirely an idea of modern, I believe, 20th century astrology. The borders of constellations between, say, Aries, Pisces, and Aquarius are modern conventions of the International Astronomical Union. And there is nothing ancient about them. The Bible is nothing more than an astrotheological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. Most people with a basic knowledge of the Bible would immediately see the fallacies and contradictions in these arguments. For example, the Bible and Jesus are clearly not hidden allegorical prescriptions for a sun and star worship, because in Genesis chapter 1, God created the sun, moon, and stars. A further distinction is in Deuteronomy chapter 4 where God specifically forbids the Israelites to worship the sun and stars as the Egyptians did. Through the prophet Isaiah, God mockingly asked if the stargazers could actually protect those who follow them from the real power and maker of the universe. In the book of the prophet Ezekiel, God showed to Ezekiel in a vision 25 men of Judah in the inner court of the temple worshiping the sun rather than God. God considered this an abomination. Additionally, in 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 5, the priests who burned incense to the sun, to the moon, and to the planets were called idolatrous priests. Not one of these scriptures are referenced in Zeitgeist because it would destroy their argument, distinguishing clearly between the celestial bodies and the creator of them. The origin of Christianity arose out of Judaism, which denounced these practices all throughout the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Here, Zeitgeist's case is very misleading. Though God opened Rachel's womb, it's difficult to consider the birth of Joseph a miracle birth like that of Jesus, who was divine and born of a virgin. Indeed, Jesus had 12 disciples, but Joseph only had 11 brothers. There is no parallel. Though Judah suggested the sale of Joseph, it was Midianite merchantmen that sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites as a slave. 
Jesus, on the other hand, was not sold, but betrayed by Judas, who was paid 30 pieces of silver by the Jews. Jesus did begin his ministry at age 30, but Joseph began his prophetic ministry receiving dreams from God at age 17. The age 30 for Joseph is mentioned in Genesis, but the Bible simply says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Aside from Zeitgeist parallels being inaccurate, the simple fact that there are parallels between Jesus and other people in the Bible like Joseph does not make either of them fictional. Inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. This is taken directly out of the pages of the Christ Conspiracy by Acharya S. However, Richard C. Carrier responded, Since I am an atheist, and since I have formal experience in ancient history, the following should hold some authority with skeptics. The Luxor inscription does not depict impregnation by a spirit but involves very real sex, and the woman involved is the mythical queen of Egypt in an archetypal sense, not Isis per se. Several things are very clear from the written narrative. The adoration scene only involves important state officials, not kings or magi. Understanding their background and cultural and historical context is helpful and necessary, but it doesn't lead to any plagiaristic scandal of the sort Acharya S wants there to be. In regard to the inscription and Zeitgeist interpretation, researcher Keith Thompson contacted John Baines, professor of Egyptology at Oxford University, who stated, The reliefs you mentioned show the conception and birth of the future king after the creator god. Amun-Ra has taken on the form of the existing king to impregnate the queen. There are links, but they are very far apart. Your source is a very long way off that, and several of the statements it makes are wrong. Dr. Janet Johnson, professor of Egyptology at the University of Chicago stated, the scene showing the god Ammon visiting the queen mother to impregnate her with the future ruler, in this case, Queen Hatshepsut, a Christian interpretation just doesn't work. When contacted about the film Zeitgeist, Victor Blunden of universities of Manchester and Liverpool and of Ancient Egypt magazine said, I have heard mention of this film before, and though I haven't seen it myself, I understand that it contains many misinterpretations and distortions of the actual Egyptian textual and relief material to get its message across. Egyptian kings were believed to be semi-divine beings, the son of an Egyptian god by a human mother. Thus the relief refers to the king Amenophis III and not to Horus. Though kings could sometimes be said to be the incarnation of the gods, due to another Egyptian myth. This is where the confusion may have come in. The reliefs actually refer to the conception of the king, showing he was born of a human mother, the queen of Egypt, by the god Amun. It was not seen as an immaculate conception, as the queen was impregnated by the god Amun. This is not the virgin Isis, but the queen of Egypt depicted, and by this time she was not a virgin as she had sex. The second scene clearly shows a pregnant Queen Matumwia standing between the two Egyptian gods. The scene generally show the baby infant being presented to the other Egyptian gods and finally being presented to the god Amun, who acknowledges that the child is his true son. Thus the interpretation of this scene by the film Zeitgeist appears totally wrong as it imposes Christian values interpretations on a typical scene showing the divine conception of an Egyptian king. The god Horus is not mentioned here. Isis is not depicted, as far as I can see. There are no three kings or magi bearing gifts, which is total fabrication and quite out of context in the Egyptian myth. Scholars disagree with Zeitgeist, which, in this case, quotes Gerald Massey as their source, a self-taught Egyptologist and practicing druid. Zeitgeist flashes a long list of quote-unquote staggering claims faster than the viewer can even read them all. 
If the movie is slowed down, however, we notice that many of these claims were mentioned earlier and thoroughly refuted in the Horus section. Not only are most of these similarities wild conjectures, many of them are not even in the Bible. Actually, the list appears exactly as seen in Zeitgeist with no sources whatsoever in the appendix of Gerald Massey's book, Ancient Egypt, The Light of the World. For example, they say, the two mothers of child Horus, who were sisters, equals the two mothers of child Jesus, who were sisters. Nowhere does the Bible even allege that Jesus had two mothers. Zeitgeist and Massey claim that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus are said to be the Christian Holy Trinity, but the Bible very clearly speaks of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the Holy Trinity. There is also references completely foreign to the Bible, such as a scribe named Hermas, Jesus as the bearded Sophia, Charis, the female Christ, and Jesus speaking brutally to his mother. They say there are seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Actually, there are more than seven in the Bible. Then they mention the seven doves of the Holy Spirit, which is also completely alien to the Bible. Not only are these Egyptian Christian parallels far-fetched, but many of them are not even found in the Bible. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove all held in common with the biblical story among many other similarities. The many similarities between the flood account in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the biblical account in Genesis point to a common source, but there are also significant differences. While Moses lived long after the flood and wrote Genesis around 1450 to 1410 BC, he was acting as the editor of much older sources. Unlike the Epic of Gilgamesh, God gave Noah specific instructions mentioning real historical landmarks in Genesis 10:19. Many cultures throughout history have repeated the concept of a great flood. In the Genesis account, God gives Noah specific dimensions for the building of the ark. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. According to David Collins, a naval architect, not even a 210 knot wind, three times hurricane force could overcome this structure which God commanded Noah to build. Contrast this to the boat in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was a huge cube. The Epic of Gilgamesh reads, Ten dozen cubits the height of each of her walls, ten dozen cubits each edge of the square deck. I laid out the shape of her sides and joined her together. I provided her with six decks, dividing her thus into seven parts. It's difficult to imagine of a more ridiculous design for a ship. When examined with greater scrutiny, the worldwide flood legends, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, do not compare to the historical Genesis account. Far from disproving the biblical account of the flood, the parallels between the Epic of Gilgamesh and the flood account in Genesis, along with many other parallels of history, lend credibility to the fact that a massive flood occurred just as the Bible describes, and other cultures have preserved the fact that there was indeed a great flood, as the Bible says. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. First of all, the time of Moses and his five books, including the book of Exodus, have been dated around 1400 BC. While the initial date range of the Sargon legend is anywhere between 2039 and 627 BC, not 2250 BC as Zeitgeist claims. 
Brian Lewis's The Sargon Legend, published from the American Schools of Oriental Research, said that the Sargon story lacks any obvious grammatical, lexicographical, or philological feature that would allow a precise dating. Lewis offers the suggestion that the story was written in the reign of Sargon II, a much later king who was possibly a usurper, to legitimate his own rule. In favor of a late date of the Sargon story are Neo-Assyrian orthographic forms, idiomatic expressions attested only in a later period, and the mention of cutting roads with bronze or copper picks. In any event, there is no satisfactory reason to propose borrowing or fictionalization in either direction. Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Acharya S is our source that notes the similarities between Moses, Manu, Minos, and Mises. As usual, these claims cannot be supported by credible or primary sources. Acharya's source is Deceptions and Myths of the Bible by Lloyd Graham, published in 1991. This book is also a terrible reference which has no original source material. Even skeptic author Michael Lido, who originally used Graham's book, agrees. Graham's Deceptions and Myths of the Bible, I will concede, is a terrible source. Once I discovered how bad the source was, I had to edit the book prior to publishing. Regarding the Mises and Moses connection, the skeptic author Michael Lido says, I will not argue the Mises story. I do not like it myself. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from Spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Spell 125, the earliest collection, dates from 1580 to 1350 BC. It is therefore reasonable to suggest that the Ten Commandments predate Spell 125, given that the Pentateuch has been dated to belong to approximately 1400 BC. However, plagiarism cannot be proven in either direction. Perhaps it would be more relevant to note the major differences between the two. The Ten Commandments represent a concise, positive instruction from God to man and the life he should lead. Spell 125 represents a countless disarray of negative protests by the already dead. Throughout history, ancient civilizations have defined right and wrong, good and evil. Nevertheless, all modern and ancient societies have maintained some standard of law or code of which there is much overlap and similarities between variations throughout history. As the Apostle Paul wrote, for when the Gentiles, which do not have the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, as far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Justin Martyr, the early Christian defender, was raised in a pagan home and was familiar with Greek philosophy. All these passages suggest that Justin Martyr is simply attempting to convince skeptical pagan audiences by parallels that would be familiar and communicable to them. He was also attempting to convince the Roman Emperor that Christian teachings and claims were not that different from other religions that enjoyed Rome's protection while Christians were being persecuted and killed for their beliefs. J. Gresham Machen, a New Testament professor at Princeton Theological Seminary stated, When Justin Martyr refers to the birth of Perseus as a birth from or through a virgin, he is going beyond what the pagan sources contained. There seems to be no clear evidence that pagan sources used the word virgin as referring to mothers of heroes, mythical or historical, who were represented as being begotten by the gods. Zeitgeist claims that the devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create these characteristics in the pagan world is yet another obvious misinterpretation of the text. Justin Martyr wrote, from what has been already said, you can understand how the devils, in imitation of what was said by Moses, asserted that Proserpine was the daughter of Jupiter. 
and instigated the people to set up an image of her under the name of Korah. For as we wrote above, Moses said, In the beginning God made the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and unfurnished, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In imitation, therefore, of what is here said of the Spirit of God moving on the waters, they said that proserpine, or coral, was the daughter of Jupiter, and in like manner also they craftily feigned that Minerva was the daughter of Jupiter, not by sexual union, but knowing that God conceived and made the world by the word, they say that Minerva is the first conception, which we consider to be very absurd, bringing forward the form of the conception in a female shape. Hence, Justin did not argue that demons or the devil copied Christian beliefs beforehand as Zeitgeist claims. Rather, they copied the older Jewish beliefs and prophecies about Jesus found in the Old Testament. In another place, Justin says, And these things were said both among the Greeks and among all nations where they, the demons, heard the prophets foretelling that Christ would specially be believed in, but that in hearing what was said by the prophets, they did not accurately understand it, but imitated what was said of our Christ, like men who are in error, we will make plain. If Zeitgeist wants to cite Justin Martyr as an historical reference, it cannot be denied that Justin knew these parallels were hardly parallels at all because he affirms that the greatest distinction of Jesus, his crucifixion, was not copied by the pagan myths as Zeitgeist alleges. He said, But in no instance, not even in any of those called sons of Jupiter, Zeus, did they imitate the being crucified. For it was not understood by them, all the things said of it having been put symbolically. Justin also notes that no proof is offered for the Greek gods, because they were mythical, but Jesus was a historical person. He says, But those who hand down the myths which the poets have made, adduce no proof to the youths who learn them. And we proceed to demonstrate that they have been uttered by the influence of the wicked demons to deceive and lead astray the human race. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean, either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Unlike these mythical deities, the documentation for a historical Jesus is actually more compelling than the documentation for other ancient figures like Confucius and Buddha. Peter Joseph makes several false statements here. First of all, none of these historians mentioned were defenders of the historical Jesus. They were secular or non-Christian sources. In consideration of the lack of attention paid by the ancient Greco-Roman world to the humble beginnings of Christianity and Jesus, being a Jewish figure in a remote location on the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire, and was therefore of little interest to the Roman historians writing Roman literature, there is a considerable amount of historical evidence that confirms his existence. There are not just four historical references for Jesus' existence as Zeitgeist boldly alleges, but in fact, 42 authors mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. On the contrary, only 10 authors mention Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor during Jesus' ministry within 150 years of his life. If liberal scholars applied the same arbitrary standard of rejection of historical evidence to other ancient historical personages besides Jesus, such as Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, they would be forced to reject all history as myth. It is for this reason the brilliant historian F. F. Bruce wrote, The historicity of Christ is as axiomatic for an unbiased historian as the historicity of Julius Caesar. Tacitus was governor of Asia in AD 112 and was known as the greatest historian of ancient Rome. In his Annals of Imperial Rome, Tacitus wrote about Emperor Nero's persecution of the Christians. He says, To suppress therefore the common rumor, Nero procured others to be accused and inflicted exquisite punishments upon those people who were in abhorrence for their crimes and were commonly known as Christians. They had their denomination from Christus, Christ, 
who in the reign of Tiberius was put to death as a criminal by the procurator Pontius Pilate. This pernicious superstition, though checked for a while, broke out again and spread not only over Judea, the source of this evil, but reached the city Rome also. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title, it means the Anointed One. Zeitgeist disregards Tacitus' reference to Jesus based on the title Christus. But how many Christs were there who were crucified under Pontius Pilate? This witness directly corresponds to the Gospel record of Jesus. Christus was Greek for Christ. These historical accounts do not only refer to Christ, as Zeitgeist alleges, but give us much more information, which also concludes that the Christus in view must be Jesus. For example, such historical documents confirm that Jesus was executed as a criminal under the authority of Pontius Pilate, who ruled Judea and under the reign of Emperor Tiberius. History provides proof that the Christians who began in Judea spread through the Roman Empire and suffered great persecution for their faith, and that these Christians derived their worship and religion from the person known as Christ, or the Messiah. All of these details parallel the Gospel accounts validating that Jesus is in view here. Suetonius was the official historian during the reign of both Emperor Trajan and Adrian. Speaking of the Emperor Claudius, who ruled from AD 41 to 54, he wrote, He banished the Jews from Rome, who were continually making disturbances, Crestus being their leader. The name Crestus is another spelling for the name Christ or Christus. This statement from Suetonius also confirms the passage in the Bible within the book of Acts chapter 18 about the exiling of the Jews from Rome during the reign of Claudius. Suetonius also recounts that punishment by Nero was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new mischievous superstition. Suetonius confirms that Christians were suffering and dying for their conviction that Jesus had lived, died, and risen from the dead a mischievous superstition as he called it, not being a Christian. Pliny the Younger was governor of the Roman provinces of Pontus and Bithynia in AD 101 to 110. In a letter to the Emperor, Pliny the Younger requested specific instructions about the interrogations of Christians whom he was persecuting. He said he made them curse Christ, which a genuine Christian cannot be induced to do. He continued, they affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt or their error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verse a hymn to Christ as to a God, and bound themselves to a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. Are we to believe that within two generations, fake characters were now being treated as historical people? The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. Josephus, the Jewish historian, is known for historical works such as Jewish Antiquities, finished in AD 93 or 94. One passage reads, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. This is the passage that has raised heated debate among scholars because Josephus, a non-Christian Jew, makes statements about Jesus that an Orthodox Jew would not normally affirm. While some Christian additions may have been obviously foreign to the text, it still contains a great deal of historical truth that Josephus could have easily documented. In fact, the vast majority of scholars do not dismiss the account as a forgery, as Zeitgeist alleges but believe that Josephus did mention Jesus in this passage, but later insertions were made by a Christian scribe, hence the statements about Jesus that a non-Christian like Josephus wouldn't have made. But the style of Josephus is authentic.
The term wise man, for example, is typical for Josephus' writings. Zeitgeist's accusation that this text is a forgery is an exaggeration. Moreover, there is another reference to Jesus in Josephus' work that is not disputed by scholars, proving that Jesus was an historical figure. He says, But the younger Ananus, who, as we said, received the high priesthood, was of bold disposition and exceptionally daring. He followed the party of the Sadducees, who are severe in judgment above all the Jews, as we have already shown. As therefore Ananus was of such a disposition, he thought he had now a good opportunity, as Festus was now dead and Albinus was still on the road. So he assembled a council of judges and brought before it the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, whose name was James, together with some others, and having accused them as lawbreakers, he delivered them over to be stoned. So this great first century non-biblical historian Josephus, writing just a little more than 50 years after Jesus' life and crucifixion, attests that Jesus had a brother named James and was a real historical figure. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. Again, there are not only four historical sources for Jesus' existence as Zeitgeist boldly claims, but 42 authors mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. We don't have time to quote them all. Expert on world religions, ancient Christianity, and church history, Robert E. Van Voorst says, The theory of Jesus' non-existence remains effectively dead as a scholarly question. Again, Zeitgeist misinterprets the Bible saying Jesus ascended into heaven for all eyes to see. The book of Acts chapter 1 describes Jesus' ascension in front of a very small group of people. To disregard or disbelieve his miracles and resurrection is one thing, but to claim that he never existed in the face of all the evidence is a premise rejected by even non-Christian historians and scholars. Richard Burridge and Graham Gould state that the questioning of Jesus' existence is not accepted by mainstream critical scholarship. Robert Van Voorst has stated, The non-historicity thesis has always been controversial, and it has consistently failed to convince scholars of many disciplines and religious creeds. Biblical scholars and classical historians now regard it as effectively refuted. It was the political establishment that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. By 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established and thus began a long history of Christian bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for the next 1600 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Regarding Constantine, Dr. Ben Witherington III writes, What then did Emperor Constantine have to do with all of this process? Constantine ruled as Roman Emperor from about A.D. 313 to 337. The truth of the matter is that he didn't take full control of the empire before 324, or very shortly before the Council of Nicaea. This fact alone should make evident that most theological issues, including those about Christ's nature, had taken a rather definite shape and trajectory before Constantine had anything to do with them. At the Council of Nicaea, Constantine seems to have favored Christ's true divinity, but he was no theologian, and it certainly wasn't he who wrote the Creed of Nicaea. Nor can it be said that he determined the canon. Constantine mainly pronounced the benediction on the deliberations that had already been formulated. Zeitgeist is correct about the Roman Catholic Church's long history of bloodshed throughout the Dark Ages, the Crusades, and the Inquisition. However, these facts do not negate the credibility of Christianity, but rather demonstrate the sinfulness of man. Regardless of how later professing Christians behaved, Jesus taught his followers to love all people, including their enemies, and to remain peaceful with all people at all costs. Violence, bloodshed, and spiritual fraud in the name of Jesus does not come from the Bible, nor does the New Testament condone such events. Anybody who reads the New Testament for themselves will see that violent Christians live contrary to what the Bible teaches, and are therefore not followers of Jesus at all. As presented earlier, 
there are numerous non-biblical historians who speak of Jesus. Thus it was not the political establishment that sought to historize Jesus. This is not to say that the Bible has not been perverted and taken out of context by the political elite for social control throughout history and even today. In the secret FEMA plan to use pastors as pacifiers in preparation for martial law, this debriefing tells pastors to help implement FEMA and Homeland Security directives. FEMA directors told pastors to preach specific passages to their congregations like Romans 13, the Bible passage often taken out of context by dictators like Hitler to hoodwink Christians into supporting him. While the Bible teaches in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 that God has given law enforcement officials of worldly governments the right to enforce penalties of crimes and to go to war against other nations, this is not a Christian duty. The Bible does not teach Christians blind submission to authority, but in many cases to resist the ordained powers in order to obey what God has commanded. If the state's orders are in conflict to Jesus' teachings, including murder, war, idolatry, etc., then resistance to those powers is obedience to God. Zeitgeist's argument is invalid because there are several examples of civil disobedience in the Bible. For example, Daniel chapter 3 documents a few of the Hebrews' unwillingness to compromise the commandments of God in submission to the Babylonian Empire. Exodus chapter 1 speaks of the Hebrew midwives who refused to obey the Egyptian Empire's commands to kill male babies. And Joshua chapter 2 documents the harlot Rahab who housed the Hebrew spies and hid them from the authorities. The book of Acts is full of examples of how the apostles of the early Christian church disobeyed the Jewish authorities in order to preach the gospel. Peter taught to obey God rather than men. Though the Christ myth theory, also known as the Jesus myth, is not original, it is very recent, historically speaking. The antecedents of the theory can be traced directly back to French Enlightenment thinkers Constantine Francois Volney and Charles Francois Dupuis in the 1790s. Proponents and authors cited in the Zeitgeist transcript have recently repopularized the theory. The questioning of Jesus' existence is not accepted by mainstream scholarship as stated by Richard Burridge and Graham Gould in their book, Jesus Now and Then, page 34. Michael Grant states on page 199 of his book, Jesus and Historian's Review of the Gospels, that the Jesus myth thesis fails to satisfy modern critical methodology and is rejected by all but a few scholars. Graham N. Stanton writes, Today nearly all historians, whether Christians or not, accept that Jesus existed and that the Gospels contain plenty of valuable evidence which has to be weighed and assessed critically. There is general agreement that with the possible exception of Paul, we know far more about Jesus of Nazareth than about any first or second century Jewish or pagan religious teacher. James Charlesworth sums it up. No reputable scholar today questions that a Jew named Jesus, son of Joseph, lived. Most readily admit that we know a considerable amount about his actions and basic teachings. Jonathan Z. Smith, who contributed to the entry Dying and Rising Gods for the Encyclopedia of Religion, said, The category of dying and rising gods, once a major topic of scholarly investigation, must now be understood to have been largely a misnomer based on imaginative reconstructions and exceedingly late or highly ambiguous texts. The category of dying and rising deities is exceedingly dubious. It has been based largely on Christian interest and tenuous evidence. As such, the category is of more interest to the history of scholarship than to the history of religions. Even liberal scholar Thomas Bosslooper acknowledges, contemporary writers invariably use only secondary sources to verify such claims. The scholars whose judgment they accept rarely produced or quoted the primary sources. Yet Zeitgeist and its sources continue to propagate this theory in spite of all the evidence. In part one of the film Zeitgeist, nearly 200 sources are cited in the transcript. Yet many of these sources are used more than once and none of them predate Christianity. For example, D.M. Murdoch, who also goes by the pen name Acharya S, is cited 29 times, and Gerald Massey is cited 30 times. The Bible is cited 22 times, almost always with erroneous conclusions. In fact, when the transcript for this film is examined in further detail, we see that less than 25% of these sources are original.
Like the French Enlightenment thinkers, Sir James Fraser, cited four times in Zeitgeist, wrote The Golden Bough in 1890 when these mystery religions were still mysteries. It is from his work and others that Gerald Massey and Acharya S. get much of their information. However, Fraser's pioneering work has come under criticism by more recent scholars. When the newly accumulated archaeological and textual evidence is consulted, his ideas are no longer valid. Professor of History at Miami University Dr. Edwin Yamauchi stated, On the popular level, Sir James Fraser gathered a mass of parallels in his multi-volume work called The Golden Bow, which was published in 1906. He discussed Osiris of Egypt, Adonis of Syria, Attis of Asia Minor, and Tammuz of Mesopotamia, and concluded that there was a common rising and dying fertility god. Unfortunately, much of his work was based on a misreading of evidence. In 1970, John Allegro, another of Zeitgeist sources, wrote a book entitled The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. He proposes that the earliest Christians were actually a secret cult group that used hallucinogenic mushrooms and utilized the name Jesus as a code word to avoid letting outsiders know about their secret activities. Allegro was criticized immediately by almost every major historical scholar. The Times newspaper of London printed a letter signed by 15 scholars in the Semitic languages who dismissed his conclusions stating that it was not based on any philological or other evidence that they can regard as scholarly. And what about this amulet of Dionysus as a crucified figure pictured and dated 500 BC in Zeitgeist? Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, cited seven times in the film, feature a picture of the amulet on the cover of their book, The Jesus Mysteries. The zeitgeist claim that this amulet dates back to 500 BC is a lie. Actually, the amulet dates centuries after the first century AD, after the establishment of Christianity. One researcher, James Hannum, documented, although it features on the cover of the Jesus Mysteries, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy are actually quite circumspect about the amulet in the text. I emailed them to ask in which book they had found it. Peter Gandhi kindly replied that it was in the second edition of Guthrie's Orpheus and the Greek Religion as well as R. Eisler's Orpheus the Fisher, first published in 1920. Oddly enough, it isn't in the appendix of either of these books. On my next visit to London, I looked both these books up at the Warburg Institute and found the note in Guthrie's work that the amulet was believed to be a fake. In subsequent email correspondence through an intermediary, Peter Gandhi eventually came clean. I will quote in full. I have to admit that James Hannum is correct. Kern's comment is indeed in Guthrie's book. In sum, not only is the amulet shown in the film Zeitgeist and on the cover of the Jesus Mysteries a fake, but at least one author of the book knew it was a fake and kept quiet about it until now. This displays the dishonesty of Zeitgeist's freak and Gandhi, discrediting their researching abilities. First, uh, let me say something about Freak and Candy book. I do not recommend that book. I would prefer that no one ever read it. It's only marginally better than Percy Graves' work. Their research is on key parts. It's shoddy, and their source citation is minimal. It's problematic. There's no way to know when they've gotten something right or wrong without redoing all their research, which makes their book useless. And that's the same complaint I had to get to Graves' book. To, to figure out what's in there that's even correct, you have to completely redo the whole work and, you know, why even read the book if you're just going to do all the work yourself anyway. Edward Carpenter is cited eight times, but is hardly a qualified expert in our current inquiry, but was a socialist poet, philosopher, and early gay activist in the late 1800s. Thomas Doan is cited 19 times in Zeitgeist for his work Bible Myths and Parallels in Other Religions. One researcher responds, in chapter 28, page 282 of Doan's book, he asserts the things you mention about the parallels between Jesus and Krishna, or Krishna, as he spells it. He gives the appearance of documenting his assertions about Krishna being crucified and resurrected, for example, in extensive footnotes. But when you check out the footnotes, each one refers not to an original document for its basis, but to another chapter in the same book. In the case of the critical for Christian's assertion, the Resurrection, Chapter 23, he then documents his statements about Krishna on page 215 in yet another footnote, this time again not to original documents of any kind, but to other scholars' books, Higgins' Anacalypsis and Asiatic Researches. 
I was able to find the Asiatic researches and could only find one sentence there in which the author unknown simply referred, almost as a passing thought, to Krishna having died and returned to his heavenly seat. What kind of argument, much less evidence or proof, is that? Clearly, Doan is making wild and imaginative assertions here. Acharya S., author of The Christ Conspiracy, was the consultant for Zeitgeist. However, when one examines Acharya's bibliographical material, it is proven to be a ripoff from the material from earlier authors cited in the Zeitgeist transcript. Some of Acharya's most cited material comes from The World's 16 Crucified Saviors by Kersey Graves. Any allegations of 16 other saviors who all resemble the same characteristics of Jesus is most likely based on this book. However, this book is an unreliable source. Even atheist Richard Carrier criticized, the world's 16 crucified saviors is unreliable, but no comprehensive critique exists. Most scholars immediately recognize many of his findings as unsupported and dismiss graves as useless. After all, a scholar who rarely cites a source isn't useful to have as a reference even if he is right. In response to the lengthy and detailed refutations of Zeitgeist, Acharya S. has recently responded in a short 10-minute internet commercial for her books. We will analyze some of her ideas which have not been previously discussed in this film. Why is the information in Zeitgeist Part 1 not widely known? In the first place, because of blasphemy and heresy laws, in the not-too-distant past, people could lose their jobs, friends, families, or even lives for merely questioning Christian dogma, which caused many people to remain silent on these issues. Here is Acharya's first excuse for not having any evidence for her facts. Yet Acharya does not even present any evidence for her excuse of not having any evidence. The blasphemy and heresy laws to which she refers were imposed by the paganized Roman Catholic Church upon Christians who would not follow the Catholics' perverted religious practices, and the only information that was suppressed by those Catholics was the Bible, because it condemned their actions. Also, much of this information can't be found in English, but it appears in other languages, like Greek, Latin, German, French, Sanskrit, Hebrew, and Egyptian. Unless someone can work in other languages, he or she may never encounter these facts. Now Acharya says the reason you can't validate the things she says is because she got them from other languages. And since we can't understand those languages, she is going to avoid referencing them altogether. Many of these parallels between Christ and other gods and goddesses of the ancient world cannot be found in encyclopedia entries, and these seem to be where most of the debunkers are getting their information from. Now she claims the facts cannot be found in encyclopedias and dictionary entries, yet she cites them. Notice the contradiction here. Acharya is citing the very sources which she claims cannot be used to validate her claims. By her own admission, she is not an expert and reading encyclopedia entries does not make an expert out of anyone. Within 49 pages, she cites Wallace Budge 47 times, who is also cited five times in the Zeitgeist transcript. But the unreliability of Budge's work is even recognized by Acharya in the footnote of her companion's guide. She says, I am aware of the debate concerning Dr. Budge's work, a controversy that some have suggested represents a form of rivalry not uncommon in the academic world or in the world at large. I personally have found nothing egregious about his discussion of the Egyptian religion in English, although I cannot vouch for everything in his hieroglyphic dictionaries, for instance, which are considered outdated in their system of transliterations but which nevertheless appear to be sound overall. Scholars in past eras were less specialized, and they did in fact make these connections within comparative religion, as my research demonstrates. In reality, Acharya's research does not demonstrate or validate these connections. Even critical, non-Christian scholars have rejected Acharya S.'s research, among whom is Dr. Bob Price, who said, She is quick to state as bald fact what turns out to be, once one chases down her sources, either wild speculation or complex inference from a chain of complicated data open to many interpretations. One of the most intriguing claims made repeatedly in these books is that among the mythical predecessors of Jesus as a crucified God were the Buddha, the blue-skinned Krishna, and Dionysus. Is there any basis to these claims which Murdoch just drops like a ton of bricks? 
Again, she does not explain where they come from, much less why no available book on Buddha, Krishna, or Dionysus contains a crucifixion account. When Murdoch speaks of the Christ conspiracy, she means it. She really believes the people got together and cooked up early Christianity like a network sitcom. Some of these parallels between Jesus and the other gods represent mysteries, such that these mysteries were not readily recorded. If these mysteries were not written down, then there is no evidence. But somehow, Acharya has made a case, despite the lack of evidence. I incorporate many pre-Christian primary sources, as well as the works of scholars highly credentialed in the appropriate fields. Actually, none of these sources predate Christianity. Primary sources or the works of highly credentialed scholars. For example, the parallels between Christ and the god Addis, who was brought up in Zeitgeist, are discussed by Dr. Andrew T. Fear, a professor of classics and ancient history at the University of Manchester in England. Even Dr. A. T. Fear, Acharya's source, says that the resurrection of Addis did not appear until the beginning of the fourth century, inspired by Christianity, not vice versa. Addis, too, with his strong emphasis on resurrection, seems to be a latecomer to the cult. The stress on the Hilaria as celebrating the resurrection of Addis also appears to increase at the beginning of the 4th century AD. It is important to remember that here we are discussing a period of centuries, not merely years. They do seem to have been provoked by a need to respond to the challenge of Christianity. Obviously this is one of Acharya's strongest claims in support of her facts since it made the cut into her 10 minute commercial. But her own source, Dr. Fear, embarrassingly admits that these similarities between Addis and Jesus were borrowed from Christianity and not the other way around, as she alleges. The idea of the Indian god Krishna's mother being a virgin is not widely known and is therefore said to be wrong. As demonstrated earlier, the Indian literature says just the opposite, that Devaki had seven children before Krishna was born. The Bhagavad Gita is then shown on the screen, which is misleading because there is no record in the Bhagavad Gita or Mahabharata of a virgin birth for Devaki. We should keep in mind that shouts for primary sources serve to remind us that Christians went on a rampage to censor and obliterate every everything outside of their faith. In fact, these censors destroyed a huge amount of the type of evidence that we're discussing here. Again, she makes excuses for not having any evidence or proof for her thesis, and warns us against those who would ask for such evidence. Without any evidence, the Jesus myth and astrotheology concepts are negligible. While it is true that the wise men, magi, or kings are not numbered in the New Testament, their gifts are numbered as three at Matthew 2.11, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The only problem here with her interpretation is that the number of gifts does not determine how many magi there were. For example, in 2 Chronicles 21.3, there were also three gifts of silver, gold, and precious things presented to the sons of King Jehoshaphat. Yet there was not three contributors, but one. There could have been numerous magi. The Bible does not specify how many magi there were because it is not an issue like Acharya S. makes it out to be. Since the December 25th birth date and three kings are so crucial to her thesis, she is going to try anything she can to make it fit. There is also no early Christian reference to the three stars in Orion's belt being known as the magi, as she also alleges. Next, we will demonstrate how the modern proponents of the Jesus myth theory and sources behind Zeitgeist and Acharya S.'s work are typically advocates of Freemasonry, Theosophy, and the New Age, which are all very similar belief systems whose goal, like that of the Zeitgeist movement, is the elimination of Christianity and a utopian society, or paradise, as presented in the Zeitgeist addendum film. In one of her online articles entitled The Gospel According to Acharya S, she states, Perhaps the devil brings peace and not a sword to humanity. Considering how many people have been killed in the name of God and not the devil, maybe the world is worshipping the wrong entity. She also writes, The devil is divine. Also cited in Zeitgeist are Godfrey Higgins, Albert Churchwood, cited six times, and Manly P. Hall, cited five times. 
which were all members of the Freemasons' secret society. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason, wrote on page 48 of his book, Lost Keys of Freemasonry, when a Mason learns that the key is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. Lucifer is a name frequently given to Satan in Christian belief. The usage as reference to a fallen angel stems from a particular passage in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 14, that speaks of someone who is given the name of day star or morning star as fallen from heaven. In Latin, the word Lucifer is the name for the morning star, the planet Venus in its dawn appearance. Though it seems Acharya S. ignorantly and lightly poses the hypothetical of worshiping the devil and the devil bringing peace to humanity, her sources, such as Manley P. Hall, H. P. Blavatsky, and Albert Pike, are much more bold in their allegiance to the devil, Satan, or Lucifer. They not only believed in the devil, but committed their work to the fallen angel, Satan, and his lies. Another Freemason quoted frequently by Acharya S. in the Christ Conspiracy is Albert Pike, who is considered one of the best interpreters of all Masonic ritual. He held the highest office in Scottish Rite Masonry and rewrote all Scottish Rite rituals which are practiced today. Pike is best known for his work, Morals and Dogma, which is found in the bibliography of Acharya's book. He said, The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians, and his priests calumniate him? Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. The true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light and God of gods, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. Besides Acharya S., who quotes Gerald Massey in her work, Massey is the main source for Zeitgeist being cited 30 times in the film. Though Acharya S. relies upon Massey's work to support much of her ideas and conclusions, Massey was not a trained Egyptologist, and his work was never recognized in the field of Egyptology. His ideas, like Acharya's, are fringe theories that lack critical support. Gerald Massey is known for his works such as The Historical and Mythical Christ. He was also a practicing druid and a theosophist who wrote for the Theosophical magazine entitled Lucifer, published by H. P. Blavatsky. H. P. Blavatsky, another source cited by Zeitgeist and Acharya S., was an occultist and mystic. She is the author of The Secret Doctrine and the founder of the Theosophical Society, a blend of Eastern religion, occult speculation, and Gnostic interpretation of Christianity. In the words of J. H. Russell, Part of its teachings are, All life is being fundamentally one with the life of the supreme existence. The Pasadena, California office of the Theosophy Society explains, A primary idea is the essential oneness of all beings. Life is everywhere throughout the cosmos because all originates from the same unknowable divine source. These ideas are repeated in the Zeitgeist movement. The Zeitgeist Movement, in fact, is the activist arm of the Venus Project. The solution to the faltering global economy offered by Zeitgeist Addendum is the Venus Project. Venus, also known as the Morning Star, is also synonymous with Lucifer. In The Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky wrote, Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan, at one and the same time. She also wrote, and now it stands proven that Satan, or the red fiery dragon, the Lord of Phosphorus, and Lucifer, or light bearer, is in us. It is our mind, our redeemer, our intelligent liberator and savior from pure animalism. Just as Zeitgeist and Acharya S. cite much of their material from H. P. Blavatsky, the Nazi movement was also founded on Theosophy and Blavatsky's writing. Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine, which is cited by Acharya S. in the film Zeitgeist, was known to be an inspiration to Adolf Hitler, specifically towards his ideas about superior and inferior races. In section 3 of Blavatsky's book, The Key of Theosophy, she wrote of the three objects of Theosophy. One, 
to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, color, or creed. 2. To promote the study of Arian and other scriptures of the world's religion and sciences. She also writes, The Theosophical Society is not, then, a political organization? Certainly not. It is international in the highest sense in that its members comprise men and women of all races, creeds, and forms of thought, who work together for one object, the improvement of humanity, but as a society it takes absolutely no part in any national or party politics. Notice the similarity in the objects of the Zeitgeist movement, stated by Peter Joseph. The Zeitgeist movement is not a political movement. It does not recognize the visionary notions such as nations, governments, races, religions, creeds, or class. Rather, we see the world as one organism, with the human species as a singular family. What the Venus Project represents and what the Zeitgeist movement hence condones could be summarized as the application of the scientific method for social concern. Today, the modern New Age revival can be traced back to H.P. Blavatsky and the founding of the Theosophical Society. Blavatsky's prize pupil, Alice Bailey, developed Blavatsky's teachings into an organized system and coined the term New Age. Bailey taught that humanity must achieve enlightenment by realizing its divinity. Bailey's teachings are kept alive today by the Lucius Trust. The organization was originally called the Lucifer Publishing Company, according to a statement on their website, because Bailey considered Lucifer, the fallen angel, a positive principle as did H.P. Blavatsky, whom they cite as a great teacher. Though Acharya S. is not a practicing theosophist, Freemason, or Druid like her sources, she does demonstrate loyalty to the New Age movement, which is no different. On page 416 of The Christ Conspiracy, she says, Despite the vilification of the so-called New Age movement, the fact is that we are entering into a new age. The age referred to in the gospel tale is that of Pisces, and through contrivance and duplicity, coercion and slaughter, the fish god Jesus, the Piscean solar avatar, has indeed been with us, but now it is the close of the age, and his time is over. As Hancock says, we live today in the astrological no man's land at the end of the age of Pisces, on the threshold of the new age. The Zeitgeist movie opens with a quote from Jordan Maxwell's Inner World of the Occult. The more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. Maxwell was also heavily influenced by H.P. Blavatsky and Theosophy. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky? Yes. Yes, I have all of her works. I think her, her, her best work was Isis Unveiled, Part 2, which is uh, theology. Right. Science. And uh, that was an exceptional uh, work. I think that Helena Petrovna Bovlatsky, the Russian mystic, was a very wise and perceptive lady. Manly Palma Hall, one of my uh, very good friends. Manly Palma Hall, one of my uh, very good friends. This main authority behind Zeitgeist and proponent of the New Age, Jordan Maxwell, believes he was put here by aliens to start his own religion. He is also one of Acharya's sources for the Christ conspiracy. Two white glowing objects came in very slow. They were not flying as such. They appeared to be just electronically or magnetically floating. And as they floated overhead, five more came in behind them and at that point I totally went uh, ballistic. I decided to rent a convertible and drive back up to Area 51 by myself and no one knew this and go back out to where I, we had had this experience by myself which I did. About a month later, now we're at the beginning of summer, I get a phone call from Paul, my, my publisher who lives in Escondido right down by San Diego and he's, he's telling me about this young lady who was a past life regressionist and he said you gotta go see this girl she's sensational and she says well and I'm just telling you what she said she said um, they are Pleiadian, Pleiadians and they have brought you here to do something and uh, you are ultimately going to be a um, emissary was the word an emissary for them they're going to channel through you they're going to use you and they will speak through you 
In the end, the most relevant change must occur first inside of you. The real revolution is the revolution of consciousness, and each one of us first needs to eliminate the divisionary materialistic noise we have been conditioned to think is true, while discovering, amplifying, and aligning with the signal coming from our true empirical oneness. It is up to you. That depends on you and not somebody else. You yourself are the teacher and the pupil, you are the master, you are the guru, you are the leader. You are everything. Freemasonry, Theosophy, the New Age, and Zeitgeist movements all represent a relentless quest towards self-deification and the integration of all knowledge and spirituality in order to create a utopian society where all is one and one is all. The Bible is also in a head-on collision with this movement because, in contrast, it teaches that all is not one, all is not God, and human beings are not God. The Zeitgeist Movement and Venus Project Utopia theoretically eliminates this problem of sin and human depravity, saying, essentially, that sin, evil, and crime is not caused by free will of individuals, but is a product of society, circumstantial experiences, and money. There is no such thing as a criminal. As repeatedly expressed, the monetary system generates corruption by its very construct. As far as society today, the most fundamental condition for offensive behavior is derived from the monetary system. In contrast, the Bible teaches that humanity's crises stem from the evil and sin of humankind. The Zeitgeist movement blames money for offensive behavior, whereas the Bible teaches the love of money is the root of all evil bringing the cause of sin back to the individual's free will and choice. The doctrines of these movements forever removes any possible fellowship with Christians. The only obvious solution to this problem is the eradication of Christianity, as Acharya S. reveals on page 416 of her book, quoting Zeitgeist source Edward Carpenter. As for Christianity's role in this new age, Carpenter states, Christianity, therefore, as I say, must either now come frankly forward and, acknowledging its parentage from the great order of the past, seek to rehabilitate that and carry mankind one step forward in the path of evolution, or else it must perish. There is no alternative. The Apostle Paul cites the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and its subsequent effect upon all mankind as the proof that God exists, that Jesus is his Son, and that the redemption of all those who obey God and his word is assured by his personal triumph over the grave. Obviously the Zeitgeist movement will label the resurrection another myth as they do with Jesus' historical existence. A cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith is the death and resurrection of Christ. This notion is so important that the Bible itself states, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. It is easy to take the previous verse from Paul's letter to the Corinthians out of context when it is not quoted in its entirety. Paul was making a point in rebuking those who said there was no resurrection, even though Jesus was resurrected. Paul said, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. Yet it is very difficult to take this account literally, for not only is there no primary source denoting this supernatural event in secular history, awareness of the enormous number of pre-Christian saviors who also died and were resurrected immediately puts the story in mythological territory by association. Also claiming that there is no primary source denoting this supernatural event in secular history is inaccurate. Unlike Zeitgeist claims about the Jesus myth, the New Testament uses primary sources. The writers of the New Testament wrote as eyewitnesses from first-hand information. In addition to the non-biblical sources, the four Gospels are primary and authentic sources for the life of Jesus. Richard Bauckham, professor of the New Testament at University of St. Andrews, Scotland, wrote in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, The Gospels were written within living memory of the events they recount. 
Mark's Gospel was written well within the lifetime of many witnesses, while the other three canonical Gospels were written in the period when the living eyewitnesses were becoming scarce, exactly at the point in time when their testimony would perish with them were it not put in writing. This is a highly significant fact, entailed not by unusually early datings of the Gospels, but by the generally accepted ones. We imagine the traditions passing through many minds and mouths before they reach the writers of the Gospels, but the period in question is actually that of a relatively, for the period, long lifetime. Religious belief has caused more fragmentation and conflict than any other ideology. Christianity alone has 34,000 different subgroups. The Bible teaches Christians to be unified in love, regardless of how many professing Christians today behave contrary. Concerning church subgroups, the Apostle Paul spoke against the Corinthian church creating divisions and strife, saying it was carnal to do such in 1 Corinthians 3, 3-11. Christianity, along with all other theistic belief systems is the fraud of the age. On the contrary, part one of the movie Zeitgeist is in every respect a fraud. This film professes to present the authoritative truth on what Christianity and pagan religions teach, yet genuine academic research and scholarship blatantly refutes the vast majority of these claims and strongly supports historic Christianity. In terms of Peter Joseph's ludicrous astrological and historical assertions, there is truly nothing new under the sun. The point raised by Zeitgeist about the book of Revelation and the end times is important for the reason that this constant talk by Christian evangelicals may actually bring about Armageddon by setting up Christians to do battle. And I firmly believe we must not let that happen. Anybody who professes to be a Christian and does battle, as Acharya put it, is a wolf in sheep's clothing, a false prophet which is known by their fruits according to Jesus in the Bible. Jesus disarmed every Christian by his words to Peter when he said, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Though many wars have been fought in the name of Christianity, these wars were in direct disobedience to Jesus' commandments. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Jesus taught to bless them that persecute and curse you and love your enemies. The Bible says that God hates people who love violence in Psalm 11.5. John the Baptist said to do violence to no man in Luke chapter 3 verse 14. Thus the Bible leaves no exceptions for a Christian to do battle if they are to obey its teachings. Commonly, people misunderstand the difference between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. The New Covenant is God's revelation to all mankind through Jesus Christ His Son. The Old Covenant had symbols and shadows for the Jewish people of the New Covenant. Circumcision was a symbol of spiritual circumcision of the heart. Solomon's temple was a symbol of the spiritual temple of the church. The Old Covenant had its laws written upon tablets of stone, while the New has Jesus' commandments written upon His people's hearts. And the physical battles in the Old Testament were a symbol of the spiritual warfare against sinful flesh which does not involve physical weapons of warfare. Contrary to Acharya's interpretation, the book of Revelation is clear in that the beast or evil world empire is given power over all nations to make war with Christians and overcome them. Jesus authoritatively told Pilate, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, implying that his kingdom is not of this world, and this is why the true servants of Jesus do not fight. Jesus also said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The only way to recognize a true Christian, according to the Bible, is by their love. Because God is love, regardless of whether or not somebody calls themselves a Christian, Jesus said, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day.